Hello, uh, sorry about that. Um, I want to welcome everyone here. Um, my name is Emma Bernstein and I'm one of the Florida House interns this summer. We have another intern joining us today, Raghav Rinchia, and we are pleased to welcome you to the fourth seminar of the Meet and Inventors series. Here at Florida House, the only state embassy in DC, we work to connect, celebrate, and champion Florida to the world. We operate as a nonprofit organization providing educational, cultural, economic, and social resources to connect Floridians with Washington, DC. In doing so, we are proud to host the Meet and Inventor series in partners with the Cade Museum of Creativity and Innovation, as well as the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame to bring Florida inventors into the spotlight. Today, we have a very special guest speaker, Dr. Nanya Su. Dr. Nanya Su is recognized internationally as an authority on termite research on popular management. Dr. Su was born in Taiwan and received his Bachelor's of Science in 1975 and a Master's of Science in 1977 from Kyoto Institute of Technology and a Doctorate in Entomology from the University of Hawaii in 1982. Dr. Su has been with the University of Florida since 1984 and works at the Fort Lauderdale Research and Education Center. Beginning in the late 80s, Dr. Su and Dr. Dow um, were scientists who, peer, uh, who pioneered a safe, effective new approach to, time, to termite management by using a slow acting compound called hexafluoron. In 1995, Centricon system became commercially available and it has been used in 18 countries, protected more than 3 million homes and saved more than 90,000 metric tons of insecticide. We're so happy to have Dr. Sue join our Meet Our Inventor series. Before we start this conversation with Dr. Sue, I would like to recognize Jamie Spurrier, the program manager from the Florida Inventor Hall of Fame. Jamie, if you'd like to say a few words about the Hall of Fame, that would be great. Thank you, Emma. Good afternoon, everyone. I first wanna thank the Florida House and the Cade Museum for Creativity and Invention for this wonderful opportunity. We couldn't be more excited about our speaker today, Florida Inventors Hall of Fame inductee, Dr. Sue. It's a privilege to have you join us. And what a perfect collaboration and celebration of innovation, of innovation in the state of Florida. So this is really the heart of the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame to celebrate the spirit of innovation in Florida and to serve as a hub for the innovation ecosystem here. Florida is a powerhouse of innovation in the United States. We bring together top tier research universities as well as um, the NASA Kennedy Space Center and a prolific entrepreneur network, as well as disruptive collaborations between industry, academia, and government. And as a result, Florida consistently ranks in the top 10 states for most patents produced or granted and the top three states for most trademarks registered. At the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame, we are a statewide initiative dedicated to recognizing and celebrating Florida's vibrant innovation ecosystem and the remarkable inventors from our state, all of whom have advanced the quality of life for Americans. It is our mission to encourage individuals of all ages and backgrounds to strive toward the betterment of society through continuous groundbreaking innovations. We are driven to support a culture of creativity, one that fuels innovation, drives economic growth, and encourages investment in Florida. So the Florida Inventors Hall of Fame is located at the University of South Tampa's South Florida campus, where our museum exhibits inventions and innovations from our inductees, including one, a display dedicated to Dr. Sue's technology. To date, we have inducted 58 remarkable inventors, they collectively hold over 4,000 patents. Each year, we hold an annual ceremony in Tampa where we celebrate and recognize the year's inductees. We'd love for you to come visit us anytime or join us at the ceremony in Tampa on November 5th. Thank you again, Emma, back to you. Thank you, Jamie. So at Florida House, we have the pleasure of hosting the Cates Museum in a State of Innovation, an exhibition about our state's incredible and widespread contribution to innovation. 
This exhibition even highlights some of the speakers you will hear from in this series of talks. This exhibition in the series itself would not have been possible without the guidance from the Cade Museum of Creativity and Invention. I would like to welcome Ellie Tom, Director of Product Development, to say a few words about this project. Thanks, Emma. I'm delighted to be here today speaking on behalf of the Cade Museum for Creativity and Invention. The Cade Museum's mission is to transform communities through inspiring and equipping future inventors, entrepreneurs, and visionaries. We are excited to have our In a State of Innovation exhibit on display at Florida House and to be partnering with Florida House and the Inventors Hall of Fame on the speaker series. The Cade Museum was named for Dr. James Robert Cade, the lead inventor of Gatorade. Dr. Cade was a scientist, doctor, musician, poet, and an inventor. The story of the invention of Gatorade and Dr. Cade's inventive mindset is at the heart of everything we do at the museum. Through our programs, exhibits, and events, we aim to spark wonder in the next generation and to equip them with the tools they need to solve tomorrow's problems and to one day change the world. If you ever visit the Cade, prepare to roll up your sleeves, ask big questions, and be curious. All of our programming and exhibits are hands-on and facilitated by a knowledgeable and energetic education team. If Gainesville, Florida is a little too far away, you can always engage with us virtually by listening to our podcast, Radio Cade, which is available on Audible, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Radio Cade provides a glimpse into the brilliant minds and hearts of world-class inventors, entrepreneurs, and visionaries, such as Dr. Sue. The Cade Museum also plays an important part in Florida's innovation ecosystem. Since 2010, the Cade Prize has celebrated innovation by identifying, recognizing, and celebrating Florida-based inventors and entrepreneurs who demonstrate a creative approach to addressing problems in their field of expertise. As one of the largest cash prize competitions for innovation in Florida, the Cade Prize has drawn hundreds of creative thinkers from diverse sectors, from Pensacola to Miami, who enter cutting edge inventions with real market potential. In 2021, the Cade Prize will award $50,000 in seed capital prizes. We're actually currently accepting applications right now. You can find more information on our website. Now to begin the conversation, I'd like to introduce our moderator, James DiVirgilio. James is one of the country's leading fiduciary investors and financial planners, as well as the co-founder of Chacon Diaz and DiVirgilio Wealth Management. James has been featured on the world's largest news networks, was a Gator 100 honoree, and a 40 Gators Under 40 award winner. James is also an adjunct professor at the University of Florida, the co-host of the Gator Nation football podcast, and the co-host of Radio Cade. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. Appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Sue, welcome to the welcome to the program. I'm really excited about diving into the content that we have today. But I think it seems best to ask a very simple question first. Why termites? What interested you in researching them? Uh, what led you to want of to really solve a, an unsolved mystery? Well, there's a short answer. And, uh, and one answer for that. Well, the official reason is that um, termites is a very, very interesting insect. Uh, the, the, the way they live being a social insect totally defied what Charles Darwin told us about the evolution. If you remember, Charles Darwin said the individual fitness, an individual that have a more advantage, fitted more in the, in the environment would need more gene offspring to the next generation. And therefore at the end, everybody's more very fit, adapted to that environment, right? But the problem for that theory is that it's based on individual reproductivity. Social insects like termites do not reproduce by themselves. If you look at the medium of termite colony, Within that colony, only one individual has to reproduce the queen. The rest of the individual do not reproduce. And if that's the case, why they do not, they develop, evolve with that kind of behavior, sacrifice themselves, devote themselves to work for the colony, if they themselves cannot reproduce, they will cannot lead, lead the trade to the next generation, right? So it doesn't explain anything at all. That's really puzzled me since I was a student. Okay, so that's the official answer. The real answer was actually 
<laughs> when I, I did my master's degree in, in, in Japan, and Emma, sorry to give you such a hard to pronounce name, the Kyoto University, and uh, where I did actually I studied the physiology of silkworm. And at the end, I realized that to study insect, you need a large number of insects. You know, and a silkworm is one of those insects, you can rear them, but you can kill them very easily too. You know, disease coming or the entire colony is wiped out and you have to start it over again. So, I, so when I was in, went to Hawaii to do a PhD, I was looking for some insect I can collect a large number without much effort. And find out all the building at, on the campus in Rosa, Hawaii are infested by termite. So if you put a wooden stake on the backyard, background in the soil on the back of my lab, wait for a week, you take the wooden stake out, you have a couple thousand termites in there. I said, this is my insect. <laughs> this, is, this is the way I want to study. So that's why I want to get into the termite study. And, uh, you know, initially, as I, I say, I was very interested in the, the how, how this evolved, that this kind of social behavior, behavior evolved, right? But uh, um, uh, when I started studying termite, very soon people will find out you study termite. The first thing they ask, a question they ask you is that, how do you control termite in my house? They really don't care about Charles Darwin or evolution. They just want to kill the damn termite. <laughs> so I've been going through that so many times, I just finally say, you know what, I better do something about control. The Charles Darwin can wait a little bit you know, before I can give you some theory. That's how I get into the control aspect of it. <laughs> so there was this, this original draw to the actual complexity of termites themselves. And then there was this practical application of termites are a problem. And of course, they were a big problem. Now, take us through the time when you started doing your research. A little was really known about how termites essentially were behaving, right? Under the, under the ground, we didn't really know what was going on and what they were doing. So you had a big problem to solve. How did you go about figuring out how to better study subterranean termites. Okay, I wish I can take all the credit, but any research and any invasion, we actually inherited a lot from people before us. So uh, the, the subterranean termite lived a real, form a large colony in the soil. You know, if you have a, if you have a house infested by subterranean termites, especially for most of subterranean termite, draw a circle 300 feet around your house. The nesting structure is somewhere within the circle in the soil. You have no idea where they come from. And usually you have several million termites running around in the network of the nesting structure underneath it. So uh, uh, a group of uh, termite researchers back in Africa in, in late 1800 already have this kind of problem. They, they study mound building termite, they also study subterranean termite. They have no idea how to go study them. So they developed this technical uh, graveyard technique, which they put, put a wooden stake in the ground around the mound. And you wait a long time now, they put a stake out, you have termite in there. And using that as a monitoring port, they were able to study something about the termite. So uh, when I went to Hawaii, my major professor, uh, Minoru Tamashiro, improved the technique a little bit by putting a wooden stake in the ground. And when the stake is infested by termite, he then put a can, a, a five gallon can on top of it, and then replace the wooden stake with a piece of wood. And that is sort of the window for them to do a research. So by the time I went to Hawaii, they already had a technique established to do that. Then I was really curious about, you know, how they move around, how far do they move, right? Uh, so we developed a marking technique, which we can bring the termite back, feed them with a red dye and turn the termite into a total red color, and then release them back to the, the one of the traps we collect them and try to track where the, the term, red termite will move around within the station. And lo and behold, I mean, when one time we released the termite, red termite in one of the can in the morning, nine o'clock, by noontime, I found red termite appear in about 150 feet away from it. And they are really fast running away from the station we disturbed them and they appear and that, that is the first time I realized whoa, we are dealing with a large colony here that we don't even know how they behave, okay? And that is really giving me an you know, option of the, you know, how to study termites from there on. And how exactly, I suppose in layman terms, do they behave, right? You, you track them with the dye, you have to find a way to get to the queen if you want to get rid of the colony and therefore 
answer the question you talked about, hey, I don't want term bikes at my house. But mm-hmm. once you found out they were moving a long way, how difficult and how long did it take to figure out how to actually eradicate a subterranean termite colony? So just to track back the question a little bit, right? I mean, uh, by the time I was in Hawaii, uh, the way to treat the termite, subterranean termite coming from soil, it, uh, it uh, changed around your house and then pour a bunch of pieces around it or drill through the concrete foundation and inject pieces underneath it. And the idea there is to form a chemical barrier to stop termite from going inside your house. And I was looking at how that's been done and said, but what happened to those termites outside your house? Still being affected. The short answer is not affected by that treatment at all. They're still surviving there. And I just imagine you spray pieces, a whole bunch of paper pieces around your house and about you know, 20 feet away from you know, how the nesting structure termite there, they're not gonna be affected by your uh, treatment. And therefore these termites still survive and they move to the next door, number one, or number two, if you find a gap underneath your house, they come right back at you. Uh, so, you know, you just imagine your, your house is just already, you know, built on a piece of soil, right? Unless you lift the house up, spray pesticide around it and put it back, you are not gonna have a complete barrier. No matter what you do, the pesticide is gonna run where you want to run. And you have no complete chemical barrier. And therefore there are a lot of gap underneath your house. Reinfestation was very common. And that is a situation I have. So I was looking at the situation at the time and say, you know what, are there any way to kill the colony? Those colonies are basically inter- interconnected network of several million termites sharing the foraging tube tunnel inside with a couple of nesting structure here and there, there. And uh, what can I do to really kill the colony, right? So uh, to do that, first of all, I was thinking of using the bait that will give some termite to eat. And the access point is very limited because oftentimes if you go to people's house, the only access point is maybe in the tree or in a portion of your house. That's it. That's pretty much the access point you have. But can I feed those termites with some kind of slow acting toxin that then carry back and feed each other? And then therefore we'll eventually kill the entire colony. That's sort of like the, the idea I have when I was back in the graduate student. But to do that, uh, there's a really important question about their foraging behavior here that relate to that strategy is that how do termite forage? If the termite going out to one spot and feed on a piece of wood and come back to the nest, next time when they go, do they go to the same place? Or do they go to anywhere else or some other places? Are they a random choice or affiliated with one stick, one point? If you or they only go into a certain point, then if I give the poison on a certain point, I only kill part of the population, okay? I'm not gonna affect the other one. And that is one really question I have to solve first. And to do that, again, I was so used to die. So I decided to put the uh, uh, paper, stand the paper with the dye and we're marking them and I shove it into one of the trap stations inside there and let them eat the red paper. And that paper, I just concentration to such that only those direct feeding will turn to red termite. The other don't have a direct feeding, don't, don't turn to red. So I, I started measuring with the hypothesis that if only individual, the only individual will go in back to the same station again, and again, to feed in the same spot, then no matter how I measure, I will not reach the 100% marked individual because only part of them will become marked. However, if it's random process, they're going everywhere they go. Eventually, everybody had to be 100%. So that is a study I did. It's a very simple study, um, but um, end result totally surprised me. Within three weeks, everybody turned red. That's mean that within the network structure they have, they are moving at random. Pretty much they come back to the nest. When they go back, they choose whatever whatever uh, a feeding site they can have, they go over there. They don't have any picky site affiliation. That is really the first breakthrough we have. That makes me feel like, okay, now it's possible now. If I know that, I can probably put the toxin in one spot 
and then everybody eventually will feed on the toxin. And that is kind of the beginning of the, you know, the entire bathing technique. Which is rather an amazing observation that they're moving at random. Now, during this process, as you're discovering what eventually becomes uh, your actual you know, chief discovery at the time, right, Centricon, did you feel like you were an inventor or an innovator, or did you feel like you were simply solving the problem in front of you? I, I was, I, I did not think I was an inventor at all. <laughs> I have no idea what invention is all about until much, much later. I was just trying to solve the problem. Which makes a lot of sense. I get to talk to innovators all the time, and that's often what happens. Uh, creating a culture of innovation it often has to do with just answering the questions that are right in front of you. So as you went down the process and you began to solve more problems, you began to get really further and further down this lens of understanding these termites. When was it that you felt like, I'm innovating something, I'm really pushing this science forward, perhaps I am an inventor? Well, using bait to kill the colony of termite is not nothing new. So many people try to do that. The exception is that nobody succeeded until I did. Uh, so when I was pursuing the line, uh, I was looking for some pesticide, some chemical that will satisfy my criteria, which is throw out the only parent. Uh, but none of them work. I went to the field many, many times, and every single one of them failed. I can kill some number of termites within a colony, but eventually they stop eating my bait and everybody survived. And that really puzzled me as to what's going on there. And I really, it was not much, much late until much later, I find out real reason why it is. But I was really frustrated with that. But I kept going anyway. And in the meantime, uh, Dow Chemical Company, okay. When I come, first come to Florida, I know what kind of chemical I was looking for. I was looking for throacting and non repairing pesticides. So I wrote a letter to about 15 chemical company. And I say, do you have something like that on your shelf, sitting on your shelf that you can kind of, I can use it to, to share with me and I can try it. And some responded, and most of, most of them did not re respond because you got to understand the way they're screening pesticides in all day and today too, is that uh, most of the pests they try to control are agricultural pests. And you're talking about the immediate kill. You spray the pests on them, they have to kill right away, right? So anything that does not kill right away, they put on the shelf. They don't think it's working anymore. So I know there gotta be tons of them around like that, right? So uh, some chemical companies respond to me. I try one after another on them, and even bring, brought them to the field. None of them work. Real part of me. Until the Dow Science at the time have this chemical called hexafluoromethane. Uh, Emma, you did a good job pronouncing it. <laughs> and that is actually uh, one of the called urea benzoate group, uh, a chitin synthesis inhibitor. It does not kill termite or insect until they try to molt, because insects are surrounded by exoskeleton, which is the uh, outer skin made of the material called chitin. And that's very similar to the material of fingernail, basically. And uh, when they try to mold, they have to form a new cuticle underneath the old skin before they shed all, uh, uh, the old skin away. And so the new cuticle made of this compound called chitin have to emerge as a new skin. If you put give the uh, chitin synthesis inhibitor to insect, the new skin being formed is incomplete. They basically have got a rupture all over there. And they try in the process to molt, they die. Basically, that's what it is. Uh, I feel bad about it, basically. But anyway, uh, <laughs> my, my late wife used to say that, you no, know, she's going to die, she's going to cremate me and spray, and spray my ashes onto my mouth. <laughs> so mean. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, so, they, they have this compound, but chitin sensitive inhibitor is a real tricky compound to deal with uh, because it's very species specific. It only work on certain species, but not the others. And the other thing is that um, for agriculture, agriculture pests really does not work very well because once they are affected by chitin sensitive inhibitor, their tooth, their teeth which is made of chitin become very fragile and they stop eating. And therefore, you know, before they get killed, they stop eating and therefore they have no effect. 
So they kind of doubt somebody have this compound, they have no idea what to do with it. They just kind of give it to me and say, yeah, well, why don't you try it? You know? <laughs> I didn't have a lot of hope either, so I said, well, give it a shot. And I, of course, at the beginning, it did not work. Uh, most of the time, I was very patient compared with more, most people. I waited for two weeks to see the mortality will appear or not. Uh, two weeks is a very long time. But so I, I tried that year in 19, 1998, I believe in 1998, 97. In the summertime, I tried this one here. It didn't work. And I said, oh, it didn't work. I put it on the shelf. And by winter time, December, usually it's slow time. And I really not have very little thing to do in the field. So I decided to give another shot. I have time anyway. I have time to kill. So I pulled that chemical from the shelf. And this time I said, I'm going to wait for one month to see what's going to happen. And one month later, I found they have actually a molten inhibitory effect. It makes it that they are wrapped around with the old skin that could not molt, and they die. I said, oh, interesting. <laughs> one month, it's a really long time. It should give me enough time to spread the entire colony. So the following year, I went to try in the field, and um, I have a colony, and one is actually my research station, and our chemistry lab was infested by termite. So I put a wooden stake and set up a trap around the building, and I put a bait inside there, and uh, within a month, activity totally stopped. I could not find any termite anymore around the, you know, from that particular time, uh, a site. I still very vivid remember I went back home that day, and in a dinner table with my wife there, I told my wife that, you know what, I found something real strange. I'm not sure this is true or not. We have to confirm it. But if this is true, this is something big. And that is sort of like the first time I realized that maybe I have killed a ton. And uh, we went on to repeat the same result one after another. After the sixth colony I killed, I realized, I finally convinced that, yes, we actually killed the colony. And that is really, you know, an aha moment is really prolonged. It's not one moment. It's really a long time. <laughs> Yeah. And so you're the first person really in human history to accomplish that feat. Uh, you mentioned during your story that there was there were obviously points of frustration, points that didn't work, periods where things weren't working the way you wanted. How did you view and how do you view failure uh, as you're heading towards your goal of, of solving a problem? Does it does it really get you down when you go to bed at night or are you thinking, OK, that didn't work. I'm going to try something new. I mean, how do you handle that as an innovator? Actually, I never get down. Actually, when they fail, it's kind of exciting. Now I present in a problem I can solve. You know what I mean? That is more exciting part of that. You know, to people like me, my job is solve the problem. If there's a problem there, I'm really excited. You know, I, I really think about it all the time. Sometimes I will mumble around, you know, in front of the dinner table, or sometimes I think a lot when I'm sleeping. Um, uh, and, and I was trying to figure out what's going on, but this question of why my initial surrounding compound did not work, and by chitin synthesis inhibitor works, uh, that explanation I temporarily proposed is probably something to do with the dose of the chemical they ingested. A dose is the amount of chemical get inside an individual organism. So, with those slow-acting compounds I used to use, it's a dose, is the time to kill is very dose-dependent. In other words, you can give a certain concentration bait to them, but if one term I eat a lot of it, the higher dose get inside the body, they get killed rather quickly. And that is probably one of the reasons, that's what I thought anyway. Later I find out that is not exactly the only reason, but, but uh, uh, at that time, that is, was my explanation. It took a while for me to come up with the explanation, but that's what I thought. It's really dose dependent lethal time. It's an issue, right? The chitin synthesis in which the time required to kill have nothing to do with how much they eat. It depends on when they're going to molt. I have nothing to do with the insects I give them, I have something to do with the insect the life cycle stage. So that is the major differences between those two types of compounds. So you have a very healthy view of failure, which, which any entrepreneur that's had any success that I've ever talked to views it the same way. You mentioned it's exciting. You don't really see it as a failure. You see it as a, a way to get further down the funnel of answering the question. 
So what questions are on your mind now? What are you attempting to solve right now? What's, uh, what's running through your brain at night, so to speak? Right now, for current technology, you mean, or you going back to old story? <laughs> yeah, what's going on right now? We know, we know what you've done in the past. Let's, oh, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. I mean, the, uh, that's the exciting part, right? So, uh, you see, I, I really love to go out there and mingle with the pest control operator because they complain a lot. What I mean, that whatever they complain is that there's a, pro a potential problem existing there. <laughs> so, so here is got my, my subject here. I, I can pick the problem and say, see, see, let's see, I can solve this one here, right? So, uh, years ago, I used to hang around in New Orleans a lot. Uh, with the, because New Orleans is heavily infested by Formosan termite, and that's that's official reason why I'm there. But the real reason is that they have a good restaurant, and good wine, uh, so I love to hang around there as well. <laughs> anyway, so I used to hang around with the pest control company and to see what they're doing it. And the New Orleans, essentially, especially in French Quarter, if, if you've been there, you know there's an old building, all you know, attached with each other with the wall. And tell just hanging around all over inside the wall, right? And it's really difficult for them to put a bait station on in the soil because the soil there is totally concrete asphalt. You cannot put it in the soil. They had to drill a hole through it to put a station in there. The other thing is that we have our ground station. If you find infestation, you can put this box of bait on top of it. Very few people love, like to use that because the homeowner hate that. And it looks really ugly and they knock it off, you know, before you even go there. So some pest control operator was complaining about that. And so I said, I have this infestation, termites inside this wall. I cannot put, do anything with them. So they would shoot the pesticide in there and just chase them away temporarily, right? And say, and I look at it and say, oh, they love to shoot pesticide. Okay. <laughs> then the sea insect pest control operator love to spray, shoot and spray. That's what they do. Can I, in, can I come up with a bait formula that they can, they can shoot and inject inside the gallery? You know, make the bait into something that is a liquid, so they can kind of put inside the wall with the void, and tell my to already eat a bunch of wood inside there, and there's a void there. I can fill them with a liquid bait, and when the liquid dry, they form a semi-dry bait, and tell my eat those bait. And that is the thing that, that we come up with. We we'll find the pattern for that, we get it. And then after I start to kind of do an experiment here and there, the uh, chemical, the, the Dow Chemical, now they call them Cotivo, come on board and say, uh, they would like to have that too. So, so now they, are, they have their own commercial prototype. They are testing to see if they can commercialize that. Uh, that is sort of like a, something going on right now. So would you say, as a, as a sort of philosophical question here, would you say that you have seen the colleagues, the students you've worked with, the projects you've worked on, the world around you, would you say it's become more innovative as a culture throughout your career to this point, uh, or perhaps less innovative? Yeah, yes and no, right? I mean, people around me, or, you know, I interact with them a lot, know the way I, I approach problem. I think I really have an impact on them to look at the thing from different angle. Uh, so, so I would hope that this, you know, to my students and people and postdoc, I, I, I interact with over these years, that I can kind of steer them into something else and get outside the box, think about the problem outside the box instead of the good traditional way. Um, Industry-wise, though, it's really difficult to change them. I mean, these guys still have a spray gear, spray tank on the back of the truck. And they're allowed to spray pesticide. You know, they see insects, it's, the only thing they think about is the spray. And so with that, it's a slow coming, but right now, um, a bait was uh, uh, commercialized in 1995. So this is almost like, what, almost 30 years now? Less than 30 years. And half of the industry are still using pesticides, spraying pesticides. Uh, and, and we have a you know, half of them, so, switch into the bait only because they realize that it's more green, use less pesticide, and you have more better control. But it's still probably a long way to go. And one way to force the issue is the regulatory agency, of course, and every regulatory agency like the EPA realize that 
we use a bait, we use actually 600 for less pesticide than spraying pesticide. And we are using a chemical that is much, much less toxic than those pieces that spray in the soil. Combined together, we are talking about 13,004 differences in environmental impact. And hopefully that the EPA, some regulatory agency, will get hold of those data I published and start to kind of force them into more green technology like bait. Uh, unless that happens, the industry is motivated by money. If they can spray pieces and making money, that's what they would do. Uh, they do not want to switch. And that is a situation we are dealing with right now. Yeah, it's really interesting in my own field of investing. Uh, it's not two plus two equals four. It's not a science. It's a probability-based field. And if someone discovers something amazing, uh, like, like Dr. Markowitz did in the 50s, it, it takes 30 to 40 years for everyone to adopt what the theory is. And, and you're kind of telling a story about that, which perhaps is more surprising to me. It sounds like your solution is, in fact, a solution as you said, that's going to eradicate an entire colony, whereas spraying is, is a Band-Aid, and yet we're still here, you know, years later, decades later, and there's still companies that are using the Band-Aid rather than, hey, here's the full solution. Mm -hmm. uh, we could spend, you know, an entire hour talking about how that happens. That tends to be human nature. But uh, at this portion, we'll get to our Q&A, and I'll start with the first one. And what advice do you have to young scientists for conducting their own experiments, for sort of embarking on the journey you did. You've already mentioned, think outside the box, you know, don't, don't just kind of fit yourself in to the narrative that exists, uh, but how do you encourage a young and up and comer to, to really begin to conduct their own, you know, improvements? Well, you know, I, I deal with many graduate students too. And one thing I really noticed is that many students getting in research with a very vague idea of what, what is the question. They probably have a question at the beginning, but kind of vague. And they get into a study, kind of start uh, running an experiment, and very soon the question starts shift. Depends on the answer. So an uh, important question really have to identify from the very beginning and say, this is the question I need to answer. You know, if it's important enough, stick with it. No matter what, don't deviate from that. And then, but the other thing is, don't fall in love with your own hypothesis and also your question. Some people will do a hypothesis and try to answer the question, and then they get the result, come back, really does not pan out. They wouldn't give up. <laughs> they keep digging the hole deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> I will tell my students and say, okay, if you find out that direction doesn't work, cut your loss now and get out of there, <laughs> find something else, right? It's really dilemma though. You want to have a person to be persistent, pursuing into answering the question, but at the same time, you have to realize where to cut the loss and move on. You know, that, those are the kind of thing that uh, young students tend to forget uh, how to deal with it, including myself when I was a graduate student. <laughs> That, that's actually some sage advice, I think, as you mentioned, follow the data, be willing to hold your hypothesis loosely and go where the, the experiment takes you versus where you thought what might happen will take you. You know, as humans, we tend to be terrible predictors of the future. Uh, and if we can train ourselves, as you mentioned, to react to the information that we're seeing and that we're getting, that's a far wiser path. That's really, really good advice. Uh, our second question is, do you, have you noticed any impacts of climate change, perhaps, on how insects are behaving? Of course, I'm sure a warming or cooling environment is going to affect how they behave, but what have you seen in your, in your observations? Yeah, a lot. A lot. Uh, one immediate uh, 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 effect we have right now, for example, is that we used to have a, a supreme termite called Asian Sopran termite, which is counterpart of Formosan Sopran termite. Except the Formosan termite is live in the subtropic to temperate. The Asian Sopran termite come from Southeast Asia and they tend to live in the tropical climate. Well, within the last 10 years, we started seeing them appear in Miami, Broward County, now in the Palm Beach County. And that have to have something to do with climate change. These are tropical species in Florida, it's sort of subtropic region. We are not exactly tropic. Uh, okay, so, so the fact that they are able to come in, in and start moving into more subtropical, uh, subtropical uh, climate tend to tell me that 
it's have something to do with the temperature issue. And the consequence of that, it's actually quite intriguing, but also kind of scary, is that we used to have hormones and suppressant termite, which very closely related species of Asian suppressant termite. And they used to be what they call allopatric species. And on evolutionally speaking, they evolved probably 8 million years ago from one ancestor, but then after that, they move into different places. You know, one species is more tropic, the other species more subtropical to temperate. Now we brought human beings, bring them together. And now climate is warming up. They tend to overlap in their distribution. And a consequence of that is that they actually mate together, form a hybrid. So there's the gene exchange going on between two supposedly different species here. Now, what's going to happen from here? It's really very, very interesting from a biological point of view, because now we have a gene drift from one population, one species to the others. We form a hybrid that we don't even know if F1 is viable or not. Uh, from everything we've seen is that the colony formed by this uh, hybrid colony is very, very strong, very viable. They can cause a lot of damage. Do they produce the offspring that also reproduce themselves or not. Now, if that happened, we have a new species here. And this is where the biologist dream comes through, right? Because we biologists, we look at the ancient time and say, wow, look at the big dragonfly. I wish you lived in an area that we can see this big dragonfly hanging around. Or we look at the history like a million years ago and say, you look at the evolution of branch of a couple of species and say, how did how this thing evolve? evolution happened from this point to this point here. And usual evolution happened when the climate environment changed a lot. Now, this thing may be a beginning of the entire environmental change that form a lot of new species that pops up here and there through the hybridization while branching into the different niche. And that is really, really something intriguing. I wish I have another lifespan of myself to start my my study again that is basically the topic i would pick if i'm younger <laughs> <laughs> yeah it'd be like uh some of the biblical characters right living hundreds of years you can study many many things if you had a lifespan uh that long for sure here's a, here's some more technical questions studies show that activated carbon inhibits invasive plant growth does the carbon in hexafluoron have any effects on uh, plant growth at homes with centricon uh, no, uh, hexafluoron is basically urea benzoate. It affects only a uh, animal uh, that need to molt with the exoskeleton, but not including snake. Snake is not arthropod. Okay, it will affect the or arthropod that will molt to shed the skin to become bigger, and uh, uh, so it will affect some uh, aquatic. Uh, uh, organism, uh, probably if they get into the water, uh, they will uh, uh, affect maybe a crop of crab or shrimp. The, the fortunate thing is that hexafluoromia is totally water insoluble. It does not resolve in the water. So it probably have very little effect on aquatic uh, uh, organism. And uh, plant as well as I'm concerned, absolutely no effect, no effect at all. And I have a I have a question that's tangential to one here. So we have can a baiting technology be used for other pests and insects? And and I know that baiting technologies are used, but I'm thinking about living in Florida and dealing with the humble cockroach, which has been around seemingly forever. Uh, obviously, with the subterranean termites, you're able to actually eradicate the entire colony. Uh, I know every insect is different, and I'm sure people are trying to solve problems like how do I eradicate the cockroach colony at my house, and why is it so difficult? So. Perhaps maybe maybe talk about how you mentioned pest control companies like to spray and they want to kind of band-aid the problem, but just how difficult is it to sort of achieve what you've achieved with termites with other insects like a cockroach or something else? I mean, each one presents a totally different challenge, right? Yeah, well, the beauty of the termite is that um, um, bait works very well because we are dealing with a colony, which we call superorganism. Uh, a colony is basically a group of individuals live together in a cooperative way. 
Uh, so if you give one the bait in one some individual, they spread around it, and the entire colony can be killed. Well, cockroaches does not live like that. They do not live in a group. Okay, they are sort of like a semi-social, but they are not exactly social like like a uh, termite. So basically, you have to go and kill individual instead of colony. And so that is real difficulty when it comes to cockroach. By the way, there's no way you can eradicate any species of insects, pests. We never done that. Even with termite, in my technique, I don't think we eradicate them. <laughs> Just imagine people would think about it. I always ask that question. I said, I always ask them, do you know how many tons of pesticide we throw at the mosquito? <laughs> and they're still around. <laughs> Yeah, that's that would be the dream. If if you could, yeah, and I know this is being worked on all the time, but if there was a better way to control mosquitoes, I think uh, that would be that would be phenomenal. I know everyone's solving these problems, but uh, I think we'll we'll stop right here, Doctor Sue. This has been very enlightening. I came into this knowing pretty much nothing about termites, other than I don't want them to infect my house. And and I found while talking with you and while researching this that, of course, like anything else in life, there's a whole fascinating array of things that uh, have occurred with termites and then with your own story just a lot of really good wisdom on how to go about solving problems and improving the world around you which of course you know you have done you may not think about termites all the time but obviously they do a lot of damage to homes to buildings and what your solution has provided is certainly peace of mind for plenty of people uh, around the world thank you so much for joining us today thank you for your your relentless spirit and energy to solve the problems in the world around you it's infectious it's wonderful and uh, certainly, you know, I'm sure that anyone that gets exposed to you is going to want to solve future problems that we have to deal with here as humans. So thank you again for joining us. It's most enlightening. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Nanya Su for participating today. And thank you to James for being our moderator. Dr. Su, I learned a lot about the process of experimenting that leads to the creation of great technologies. It was really interesting to hear about. Thank you to everyone who were able to join us today. We'll be, we will be hosting the Media Mentor series every Tuesday, so make sure to invite your friends. We're excited to see you all next week for our next speaker, biomedical engineer, Dr. Roberta Good, who has transformed minimally invasive cardiac surgical and diagnostic procedures. Thank you again to our partners and Dr. Sue, and we hope you had a great time here at Florida House on Capitol Hill, where you're always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.